The report that I'm presenting exists in a paper version, which I just found as we came in today. If you haven't located it, it's out there. Also as a PDF, and in both versions you find a link to a, um, a website which has country fact sheets and then a link to a Facebook site where there can be discussion. We're very much aware of the need for uh, social media to get uh, something like a web of knowledge operative in this context and painfully aware that in studying something like the status of the translation profession, we're dealing with a very dynamic moving object. It keeps changing. We're getting new information. Uh, it can be put on a website very quickly. In fact, I did it this morning for Bulgaria. Uh, you'll find uh, information missing for Bulgaria. I was contacted last night. I've got some information. Many thanks to the informant for that. Uh, perhaps, as much as I'm very pleased that this will become a book with a, a private publisher, um, perhaps the information is suited to other forms of dissemination. How can I move that along? Oops, no. Yes, there we are. This uh, research, it's not the 14th of September, is it at all? Hmm. It was in advance of its time. <laughs> uh, was carried out by some unabashed academics. We are really academics. We are not really making apologies for that. My doctorate is in sociology, but I've been working with three economists. Uh, François Grain, who will present uh, the main part of the economics here today, and my former doctoral student, Andy Chan from Hong Kong, who was the first to apply the economic theories we've been using to the translation profession. So we've been stealing his ideas, which is one good reason for him to be here today. The project that we dealt with um, came with some very specific questions, which I'll answer very quickly. Those are the four questions up there. Uh, before moving on to the actual economic analysis that we have. It's important, though, to realize that we are dealing with the question of status as something quite different from um, the, the actual quality of what translators do or associations do or um, a training program does. Status here doesn't mean how good you are at doing what you do or how much other people like what you do. It can mean that. But for us, um, it means how well you signal to the other person that you're working with what you're able to do. And as you'll find out in a minute, economics has something to say about this. The first thing it says is that we're all basically lying and we have an interest in lying to each other. Uh, as translator has an interest in misrepresenting, in over-evaluating over their actual capacity to produce a quality text. And you might also say that the translator's client has an e equal interest in misrepresenting the market value of the translator's work. I like economics. It accepts that we're lying. But if the lies are not too out of kilter, a market can operate and operate quite successfully. Now, that model of asymmetric information, that I know more about what I do than you, that's asymmetric information, uh, also allows one to describe bad markets, what happens when a market doesn't operate well. Uh, this will be when it's impossible for a person to signal anything like their true worth. And this, I hope, will be explained. Will Andy go into the market for lemons? Uh, it's based on, on a comparison of uh, translators with used cars. The classic case is, I'm sorry, this is a bad simile, but you'll see the point in a minute. Um, it's, it's a classic study in economics of how the market for used, secondhand, pre-loved cars. Uh, I was a student. I went through a lot of these. Uh, failed to operate when everybody was lying about what's under the bonnet. Now, if you've ever bought a second-hand car, go back to your student days, perhaps, 
you will know that you have no way of knowing what's actually there. It can look nice and shiny on the outside, but something's going to happen within a thousand kilometers or so. Translators are a bit like that. Translations are like that. When we sell a translation to a client, almost by definition, the client doesn't really know what's under the bonnet. And they need external signals of that quality. Now, in the used car market, that problem was solved by standardized signaling, by legislation that required people to say exactly what had happened to this car, uh, what its, its actual state was. Do we trust it? No, perhaps not entirely, but enough for the market to operate. Because without the signals, without efficient signals of status, the price for cars was very low, and good cars did not enter the market. Only bad cars were there, so nobody trusted any signal, and you got a, a market disorder. You got a market where good quality could not get paid. That's the model we've been applying here. So we're not looking at how good people are at translating. We're looking at how good they are at signaling their quality. We are looking at signaling mechanisms. So we look at a translator's association. We look at a translation exam or an academic system. Or we look at a professional exam as sets of market signals. I, I want to emphasize this because um, we're getting some feedback from various people saying, oh, you didn't present us in a good light, etc. Well, no, our interest was looking at how well they're signaling. We're not saying anything about the intrinsic value of any translator association or training program. It's very important to have that in mind and to know what we're doing. While extending my thanks, well, um, yeah, I, I, I should extend very sincere thanks to the people who helped us do this. All in all, we contacted, we used information from 101 experts and informants from around Europe and beyond, beyond because we have comparisons with Canada, the United States, and Australia. Sorry, 102, because I got Bulgaria in last night. Um, and many of those people were contacted through the European Society for Translation Studies, which supplies a natural network of scholars working on translation. I'm very grateful you mentioned uh, a web of knowledge about translation. I think that the European Society should be a natural partner in any such endeavor. The status of the project, the brief duration, nine months, did not enable us to produce to promise to produce new knowledge. This was not a well-structured empirical project. We merely offered to do a survey of surveys, betting that there is enough information already out there for us to locate it, put it together, make it speak with each other, and to get some results on that basis. And I'm quite happy uh, with what we managed to do there, although I confess that thanks to the 102 experts and informants, I believe we have provided some new information of real use, especially about translator associations, as you'll see in a minute. I was surprised, not pleasantly surprised, but extremely surprised to find that we found 103 translator associations within the European member states. Uh, why do translator associations not send an efficient signal of status? Well, perhaps it's because there are 103 of them. If you get 103 different signals, it's very hard for that not to become noise. So, to the specific questions that we were asked. What is the relative status of academic qualifications and training? Well... Uh, our, our initial conclusion for a long time was translation is an unprotected profession. It means that in no country is there any law that stops anyone from translating. One of my favorite similes, translation is like singing. Some people are paid a lot to sing very well, opera singers. Other people are paid to sing 
and people will listen to them and be in, uh, and enjoy that. But you can't stop anybody from singing in the shower. It's very hard to stop anyone from translating, and I believe we're moving towards societies where everybody, with the aid of online technology, will be able to do something like translate, the same as what I sing in the shower is something like singing. And then uh, Slovakia came along, and Slovakia actually has a law uh, which attempts to restrict who can sell or who can be licensed to sell a professional translation. Uh, that is reported on in, uh, in our publication. We found that there are qualifications, strong signals, that do have a real market value. They are firstly the system examination certification system set up by the Chartered Institute of Linguists. I should also mention the American Translators Association, where that certification system has a very definite market value. And in Germany, the Diplom Übersetzer status. I don't know if that's been replaced by a master's these days, I guess it has. Um, has a, a, a market value to the extent that we can say that uh, they are working as good, strong signals. Apart from that, though, it's a little difficult. Uh, we note, and I'll note further on, that most employers, we've looked at several studies of this, we've looked at work done within the Optimale network, which was very useful for this, and uh, I, I had um, uh, brainstorming sessions within uh, an association of, uh, European Association of Translation Companies. Um, most employers don't trust academic training, particularly, or professional exams, and they like to do their own testing among which I might add our clients. So the general image is some things, some signals do work well, but a lot of signals are not working well enough for employers to trust them. If translators were used cars, employers would want a very long test drive. We were asked about authorized or sworn translation. It goes by various names in various countries. Uh, this was a very good question because it would seem the one part of the translation profession that should be controlled, should be regulated. Most countries do have some kind of protected title, but mostly it's not delivered by an academic institution. This was the case, however, in five countries. And in seven countries that we found, um, it's not the translator that is actually doing the certification. It's a system where translations, done by whomever, are then certified by notaries or legal professionals or nobody. Now, what was interesting, oh, and Greece is in flux. Uh, I won't go into that, but that's described in the report. What is interesting is that when you map the various options that are available, or that are being used uh, for the, um, the signaling here of who can certify a translation as being legally valid, uh, you'll see just the colors. You'll see that, for example, the systems where translations are certified but not translators is certainly operative in, in Great Britain and, and Ireland. Um, and you might say, ah, it's because they are common law countries. No, but it's also the case in Portugal, uh, Italy, uh, Tur Turkey, etc. The, the, the one lesson here was that as much as the lawyers come back and say, we can't change this system because it's embedded in our legal tradition, the surface analysis suggests that it's not true, that there are divisions out there which are not embedded. There are similar solutions coming from very different legal traditions. Uh, this would suggest that if anybody does want to ever harmonize the certifying of sworn or legal translators, don't let them tell you that it can't be done because the differences don't map. The differences between the signals uh, don't map on to the different legal traditions. It's one kind of answer. Another question was, what is the role of professional organizations? 
And the answer here is many and varied. Professional associations are just a very mixed bag of different things. There are the great ones founded in the 1950s, early 60s, but mainly 50s, the heroic age of the translation profession. Uh, when you had some very big, well-established national associations founded, uh, you had for interpreters the AIC as well, and those have managed to maintain their status within their national contexts. And uh, some uh, are, also, are then associated with certification systems, the two I've mentioned, the Institute of Linguists and, and the ATA. However, what we find is that the associations, especially those of recent creation, have been doing quite different things. Some are more like unions, particularly in, in the United Kingdom at the moment, where they're going through uh, a battle against the privatization of uh, interpreters for public services, or for the justice system at least. Uh, the, the unionization element has become important. Or lobbyists, uh, who are good at political representation, the BDU in Germany, can be seen as operating very well in the political uh, signaling system. Others, though, are more social in character, especially the ones that are using internet technologies, web-based technologies, who are giving out good information on what's happening in the changing market, who are giving training in translation tools, uh, for example, and often are just providing a forum to people for people to discuss their problems. Others are moving towards a job agency. And uh, still others are more like associations of former students from particular institutions. What is worrying, though, is that when you map the timeline of creation and the size here, the number of members, you find up here the American Translators Association with some 11,000 members is far, far away and above greater than anything we have in Europe. Uh, this is the... Um, a translator section, I think, of the... Uh, no, no, this is the BDU, and down here you get the uh, translator section of the Chartered Institute of Linguists, uh, etc. Okay? Now, things were founded in the 1950s. For an association to send out a strong signal, it needs two basic things. It needs longevity. If you've been around for a long time, you have prestige, and it needs size. And one would imagine that strong signals would be sent by these, and it's true, they do. But then, why have all these other things come along and, in fact, are being created as we speak? While we were doing the research, three new associations were founded, and one has been founded in the past three weeks in Bulgaria, so I heard, uh, where they're having a debate about, about uh, how to authorize uh, sworn translators. And the answer, I think, is the progressive fragmentation of the profession that can be seen there. You get, in the uh, 70s, uh, literary translations break away. Uh, late 70s, 80s, sworn translators form different uh, associations. More recently, audiovisual translators are setting up their associations. And the ones uh, after 2000 are often very small, very dynamic, web-based communities who are circulating information very quickly and very efficiently. So, uh, translator associations are not always there to send strong market signals, which is why we have the proliferation of them and the weakening of the existing market signals. This is um, a strange map. Uh, by doing some dubious statistics, we could estimate the relative size of the uh, demand for translators in different countries. We could then count how many translators were in the associations, what percentage that is of the theoretical number of full-time translators required in the country. So uh, we found low numbers for Ireland, Italy, Turkey, etc. A low number under 20% could be good if you are the creme de la creme, the prestige. Uh, translators, members of that association, that could be a very good signal. Or, if nobody knows about you, your association, it can be a sign of very weak signaling. The fascinating thing, though, is, is the, the, that light blue color that you find, where we get 
more than 100%. We get more people, members of associations, than can theoretically be employed in the market. Hello, something's going on here. Uh, and what was going on was basically uh, that these are small countries where uh, accession to the European Union has moved the market for translation well beyond the macroeconomic indicators we were using. And that's the basic explanation uh, for that, I think. Also, the high number of part-time employ employment. Uh, we found that in general, putting all the statistics together, uh, part-time employment is 60% or above, about 74% freelance, 70% women. Those three figures might speak to each other and tell a story, or not. Uh, but it might suggest the, the, the traditional, perhaps, myth that this is a, a profession that can be done at home by women bringing up children on a freelance basis. No, bringing up, they're doing the translation on a freelance basis, not the bringing up of children. Um, I'm sorry I'm speaking for the men's team over here at the moment, but uh, I don't think that's a fatality, but it is a logic that is prevalent, certainly in a certain age group, and might explain uh, the relative lack of professionalization, why uh, translation is not a profession that has gained um, an exclusive status, uh, as is the case of dentists, architects, etc. What do employers think? This again is mainly from the Optimali survey, with uh, some of her own information. They do like to see a university degree, but if you can translate and you don't have the degree, you're, you're on. Uh, experience is what they're really looking for. Word of mouth among employers is worth more than anything. A telephone call to the previous employer, a letter of recommendation. Most do run their own tests, which says that the other signals are not working, as I said. And um, that the field of technical translation and localization looked at in market terms is not showing market disorder often because uh, of outsourcing. A lot of uh, localization work is being outsourced to India at the moment. Um, uh, on the other hand, market disorder, if you look for it, is uh, apparent in any um, translation service applied, or in, in most countries, for um, in immigrant languages for the public services, uh, audiovisual um, subtitling, where you have the inroads of, of crowdsourcing or volunteer translations coming in, you do get significant signs of, of market disorder. That is, good translators not entering those segments of the market. But in general, technical translation is fairly solid. That's the end of my part of this presentation. I'll be back with the final conclusions.